Hello, and welcome to today's e-seminar. Today we'll be exploring the inner workings of creating the Jabber magazine that we here at Quark publish to the iPad every quarter. We'll also look at some of the techniques that I've used to accomplish a few of the inner activities you've seen in the issues, some of my best practices I tried to adhere to, and a few tips and tricks to help you create your own publication. So, my name is Chris Nurnberger, and I'm the Senior Graphic Designer here at Quark. I've been creating and publishing iPad apps and issues ever since Quark started developing Quark Express to do so. I've had the privilege to not only work on Jabber and a few other apps that we have published here at Quark, but I've also had the opportunity to work closely with many of our customers who also see the importance of delivering content and media to the iPad and other digital devices. So in, in today's eSeminar, we're going to touch on four main points. First, we're going to start with where to start. It's important to have a good foundation. There are a few things to keep in mind, and I'll briefly highlight what I took into consideration when I was creating Japper. After that, we'll talk about creating the magazine. In this section, we'll take a few minutes to go through how I created Jabber and then dive deeper into some more of the advanced interactive techniques that don't necessarily come prepackaged, but are possible by utilizing many of the interactive features that are available to you. After that, we'll uh, touch on some best practices. With digital publishing being such a new form of media for publishers and designers alike, I've developed some best practices that are very important to keep in the back of your mind while you're building your issue. I'll mention a few that I think are most important and show you how they were implemented within Jabber. And lastly, we'll touch on a few tips and tricks. Having created quite a few of the issues for Quark and others, there are a few tips and tricks that I've picked up along the way that will help the, the experience of creating an issue more pleasant. I'll share a few uh, tips and then a few tricks and discuss how they will help you out in the long run. So, without further ado, where to start? As with every project, it helps to build a little bit of a foundation or starting point so that you're able to navigate your way through the creation process. When you start to create an issue, you want to be aware of your audience. Are you creating an issue for a younger generation? Are they technologically savvy? Or are you going to have to walk them through things a little bit more? Is this going to be geared towards the entertainment side of the spectrum? Or is this a little bit more technical uh, as far as like a business prof or professional business uh, issue? All these questions and countless more are important to take into consideration when you start to plan out how you are going to set up your layout and your issue. It's the same as creating any other design. You want to make sure that your message is on target for you and your readers. This is just as important in publishing to the iPad. And I demonstrated that here with how we've approached Jabber. Jabber is a quarterly digital publication targeted at designers and anyone else who's interested in how, and not only how, we do it, but what is possible from Quark Express and also from digital publishing. From this, I decided that our most typical user would be someone slightly familiar with digital publishing, someone who's tech savvy. If they're reading it on an iPad, it's pretty much a no-brainer. I mean, if they own an iPad, it's pretty much a no-brainer. And if they don't own an iPad, they're probably not reading the issue because it's supposed to be read on an iPad. Um, but so I thought the age would vary. In most cases, our viewers would be probably above the age of 18, um, but maybe they're younger, 16. I don't think many four-year-olds are interested in graphic design. So that's kind of where I started from, and that there were other many uh, that there are many other characteristics that I thought our viewers would consider represented them. But since I only have an hour, we'll kind of skip through uh, what the rest of those were. So uh, knowing this. I set the brand of Jabber to be very contemporary, modern, and fully utilize all the interactive features available to me within each issue, and to expand on those as uh, we worked our way through each issue and introduced uh, our readers to these interactive elements. Now, because digital issues are documents with chapters and have a structured flow of content, 
it's a very wise idea to create a dummy. Those of us who have done any sort of publication may recognize this diagram. Essentially, it's a way for you to keep all your content in one place and allow you to arrange pages, sections, articles, and even ads in one central location where you can easily move them around. The benefit here is that you can create you can use this dummy to make sure that your flow of to make sure the flow of your content makes sense. I also use it as a way for me to ensure that everything is completed. It's almost like a running checklist. And if you see here, I've set it up to represent three different things. A design complete, interactivity complete, and linking complete. But not only does it show that, it shows which orientations are complete. The green representing both orientations, blue representing the portrait orientation, yellow, landscape, and red would be neither of them that are done. Just a way to make sure that when I go to publish it, it's completely done. Uh, it's a little different than your traditional dummy because well, in traditional print you only had one orientation. Here we have to take that into consideration, especially if we're going to be using to the dual orientation feature within an iPad. So the important part of keeping a dummy is making sure that you keep it up to date. If it gets out of date, it's not going to do you any good. Um, it comes in very handy as you're starting to lay out things, as you're starting to put together your table of contents at the end of your creating this issue. Now, it's decision time. So now when you're creating your dummy, you have some decisions to make that will influence the core structure of how your issue is laid out. Are you going to want to lay out your copy in an embedded way? Or are you going to want to utilize some of those interact features and create scroll boxes? Both have their benefits, and depending on what you're looking for or looking to accomplish, you want to choose one of them. But there's also no rule against using both in the same issue. Some issues that I've seen have only used two orientations. All right. I've only used one of the two orientations, I'm sorry. Personally, I believe that since both are available to you, you should capitalize on the opportunity. It's a little more work, but I feel that the final outcome outweighs the minimal upfront work. If you do, however, want to only use one orientation, you'll want to make sure that you set that up at the beginning to avoid doing all that extra work that goes along with laying out content in both orientations. It's in this, uh, the new project menu. When you select it, it says iPad, and you have your option of choosing both horizontal and vertical, or one of the, either one. And lastly, videos are a great additional feature that can be found in digital magazines and separates them from kind of traditional media. You don't typically see, actually you will never see, a video playing in your t traditional printed magazine. <laughs> it's kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> However, it's a great way to offer additional information and or communicate an article in a different manner. I'll talk a little more about some of these concerns with videos a little later on in this e-seminar, but when you're just starting to put together the issue, you'll want to make sure that you take them into consideration. You don't want to have all your issues or videos at the front or at the end of your issue because then it starts to feel a little heavy, a little lopsided. A balanced issue is what we're looking for. Now, once you've got your dummy set up, you can start to place your pages and create your master pages. Think about what elements will be present on certain pages. In Jabber, one element that is on absolutely every page is the table of contents icon. It's a good practice to have it. I typically place mine in the upper right corner. Um, upper left hand corner is fine. You know, Think about what you want to do. You don't necessarily have to place them in a corner, but I would highly recommend having a table of contents icon just so that way your users can get back to um, a place that they can hop to the next article that they want to read. It's just a good, uh, good user interface. So, since I'm going to place this on every page, in both orientations, it makes sense for me to set up a master page that works for that works like that. Um, I also, in 
the Jabber issues have used the stacks feature, which puts pages on top of pages and requires the user to scroll vertically. Um, similar to a, a scroll box, but in this case, you're not scrolling through a box, you are actually scrolling pages vertically. Um, the problem with that is that users are not necessarily accustomed to that sort of interaction, and so you need to provide some affordance or some direction for them. So what I did is I set up a second master page. You can see that in this slide that says B master B to show um, certain icons that relay to the user that there's content below the screen and you need to scroll up to continue to read. Um, the trick with this is that you can't put any interactivity on your master's page. So there's two ways to go about this. You can either put the picture button or a picture box in the master's page and then once you're back into the main layouts, the iPad vertical and iPad horizontal, you can add the interactivity in there or you can place the icon in the master's, go back out to your main layouts, again the iPad vertical and iPad horizontal, place the box, give it its interactivity, and then copy and paste in place on every page. Both ways are a little time consuming, but that's the best way to do it. And it's a lot faster than placing the picture box and putting in the interactivity in each individual box over and over and over again. <laughs> So, now we're finally uh, getting into creating the magazine. And those are the things that you'll want to consider when you're just getting into the issue. Now we're going to talk about creating the issue itself. In Jabber, I placed the copy in two different ways. I briefly mentioned to you that you'll want to take, into, take this into consideration when you're creating your dummy, and I'll explain it in a little greater detail here. Essentially, the difference is, with the embedded copy, there's no user interaction for them to read the entire article. This is the case unless your copy goes a little longer than what can be fit on a page, and in that case, you're going to want to create stacks. So all the interactive features are available to you in, when you're using this setting. The user can navigate from anywhere in the issue to one specific point in this copy, Whereas with scroll boxes, you can fit the entire article onto one page, and all the user needs to do is scroll to read it all. Scroll boxes are great because you can use markers, which is another interactive element that will allow you to influence slideshows and other interactive features as the user reads through. And there's no additional interaction required. So these are created as separate layouts that Quark calls composition zones, the scroll boxes. You want to use a good naming convention because you're likely to have quite a few by the end of your issue. And you'll want to be able to navigate more effectively between the different layouts. Now, another important I thing to keep in mind is that iPads are graphical devices. They almost beg to have color and texture, especially now with uh, the retina dis displays. One of the easiest ways to accomplish this is by using imagery and graphical elements in everything. Use large photographs to fill the entire screen and then section off a certain space for your copy. If you have a decent amount of copy, you could always use a scroll box to squeeze more into smaller spaces. Uh, I did that here with the, the page you see here. Uh, that box is a scroll box where the text is and there's quite a bit of copy. Texture is also important to uh, include in your document, otherwise it becomes very flat, unless that's an effect that you're going for, but here in Jabber we weren't. Uh, in Jabber I used a very wide variety of textures ranging from half tones and even block patterns to <laughs> so scribbles and kind of doodles on my, for my notes that I, uh, I used to entertain myself in some of the less uh, exciting meetings we have here at Quark sometimes. And now, let's uh, let's pull up our sleeves, 
dive deep into some of the more advanced interactivity. I'm going to pop out of here, out of my PowerPoint presentation, and jump into some of the actual files that we used for Jabber. Okay, let's have that pop up. So, this is Jabber, Volume 1, Issue 2. And uh, this file was the final file three days before we published it. I believe we published it on March 1st. So, the first element that I want to show you is the table of contents in Jabber Volume 1, Issue 2. It was done differently than most out there. It's not a static page, and I'll scroll here to it right now. Um, looks like we have a little bit of a font issue. I'll take care of that real fast. There we go. So, this is what the page looks like. And you know, you're probably asking yourself, well, where is the table of contents? Or at least those of you who haven't gone out and downloaded the Jabber issue yet are asking yourself that. But, fear not, it's there. This is our table of contents in Jabber. It's a scroll box, and I've used it to visually depict the different pages. And it, I mean, it goes for a little bit of while, a little while. Um, I've shared it on both orientations, so I only had to create it once, um, and uh, so let me show you how, real quick how I've set this up, because I'm sure you're all dying to know. Um, first, we need to grab the picture box, and we want to create a window as wide as the viewable space that we're going to have, which is... Um, from here to here, down to about here, and all the way over. Uh, let me show you. You can kind of see it. It's right there. It's the blue outline among many other blue outlines, but that is it, right? So first, create a box. And I'm not going to walk us through the actual full process because it took me a little while to do it, but we'll kind of jump a few steps. Drew a box. It's a picture box. Then we go to our little trusty App Studio Dialog, palette thing. Let it come up. It says we have one assigned, unassigned item. We're going to create a scroll box, right? And we want it to be horizontal since it's going to scroll horizontally off the screen. And here we'd click create layout. Now we want to make sure that we name it something. Uh, in Jabber, I always name it TOC, obviously. Um, and I wouldn't adjust the width just yet because we're not quite sure exactly how wide it's going to need to be. All right, so let's pretend that I clicked create. I'm gonna actually take you to the, get rid of that extraneous box. I'm gonna take you to the actual table of contents. So see what I mean when I said that you're gonna have lots of different layouts by the time you finish your issue? This is actually less. <laughs> than the first issue. I started to realize that you can share your issues or share your layouts across the different orientations and that helps to reduce the amount of issues or layouts you have. Anyway, back to table of contents. Click here. Let's zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see what it looks like in its entirety. All right? And so as I was creating this, I kept on needing to expand it to the left or to the right more and more. Um, and that's a really easy way, easy to do. You just go into the, your layout properties. Uh, you can do that either going through here, right? Layout properties, or the key command is Apple Option Shift P, right? And you just keep on increasing, increasing the width. Now, do not increase the height on vertical, on horizontal scroll boxes, and do not increase the width on vertical scroll boxes. It just gets complicated. Um, if you're going to want something to be a certain height or width, depending on the orientation, um, try to make sure to take that into consideration when you're drawing your first box on your main page. So this is the table of contents. Now, you're wondering, maybe you're wondering, how did you share this across the two different orientations? If your buttons 
link, notice the red boxes, those are button action items or interactive boxes. If they link to one page, how can you link them to one page in both orientations? Because technically, they're in two different lands. Well, good question. The trick here is you need to give it two different actions. Now, you'll see that it says 129, 229. One means it's going to the portrait orientation. Two means that it's going to the horizontal. So when you're viewing it in the horizontal orientation, it will take you to that page. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. Now what we've done, however, is if you have something wrong, either you don't have that page in existence or you forgot to include the, the initial differentiator, the box will go red. Kind of a nifty little double check for all of us designers out there as we're trying to rapidly move through the process of creating these. Um, another really cool feature that I'd like to show you while we're in the second issue is the Twitter feed that we've incorporated in or embedded into our issue. And that's found Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, right here. Uh, like I said, for those of you that have downloaded the issue and kind of explored it, maybe you've noticed, but as you read through this copy or this article, the very end is a live Twitter, and it will always be the most recent tweet that our friend Stacy Baird, the author of this article, posts to her Twitter account. Um, I'm not going to go through the technical process of how we do that because actually in our section of how we do how do we do that I walk you through step by step in about five steps how we actually created that but I really wanted to point this out because this also is a great example of markers uh, we'll go uh, to the seven tips box and as you can see, if I turn on my guides, oops, haha, <laughs> wrong button. Turn on my guides. You can see we have a red box. Now I typically try to put all my interactive elements on a different layer. Um, so that way I can kind of keep them separate and uh, keep things organized. But so a marker works very simply. Um, you need a content ID and the content ID is found in the upper right corner. So if we're going to influence a slideshow with a marker, we need the content ID of that slideshow. And in this case, it's 10, 20, 93. And your content index is what slide in that slideshow you'd like to be shown when this box enters into the viewable plane or viewable window I guess is a better way to say it. And as you can see this one now says two and so on and so forth all the way through. Now I'll scroll real quick over to show you what the box for the Twitter thing looks like. Essentially it's just a standard picture box um, we have it going to a local HTML file that gets embedded into this scroll box. I'm allowing interaction and scrollability, and um, that's pretty much it. Like I said, for even more detail, uh, we don't have quite a bit enough time in today's e-seminar to go through uh, the whole process, but it is in Jabber issue 2, uh, how to accomplish that. Um, let's see, we'll go into the first issue now and kind of show you a few things here. This is Jabber issue one. And as you can see, the table of contents has changed. Uh, the first issue, it was uh, drastically more important or difficult to create the interactive scroll box um, because 
what happened with the most recent update to Quark Express that everybody I'm sure has. It's 9.2.1. Um, we added some interactive features and capabilities to our um, to our App Studio capabilities. I wanted to show you the opinions page because this one is very, very cool. So I want to get everybody thinking about how we can take the standard eight interactive features that come along with the App Studio dialog box and how we can enhance those and kind of create other additional uh, interactivities with them. And that's what I want to show you here is by combining certain elements, you can create unique interactive experiences for your users. And I did that here with the opinions page is what I've done is I've created a scroll box. I don't know if it's going to show very well here on my Mac, but and then also within my scroll box. So this is opinions V2, right? And look at how many layouts we have with this one. This one had a lot of layouts. So opinions v2 vertical scroll. Where is that v2? So many. See again, very important to name your layouts in a way that makes sense to you. There it is. So when you're reading issue one and issue two, actually, you can scroll to the horizontal to see the article and then scroll vertically to, re to continue to read it. So what I've done here is I've placed a scroll box within a scroll box. And you can do that also with, a, you can have a, a slideshow within a scroll box. You can have a video within a scroll box or an audio. There's a lot of things that you can do now within a scroll box to allow your user to interact with the content that's being read. It's a really cool way to kind of maintain the integrity of the design, right? So can you imagine if all of these just had their text showing? Well, it wouldn't be as appealing as if you have a very intricate and well-designed page that allows the user to interact and to dive deeper into the content that they're interested in. And then lastly, while we're looking through the issues, is we'll show you how, or I'll, I'll talk briefly about the Oscar Blues um, ad that I've created, because that one's a multi-state interactive slideshow that allows the user to access information about the certain beers that Oscar Blues produces. And as with the Twitter implementation, I've also included in the how they do that in the first issue. So you're going to have to go out and read both issues to know how to do both things, but I'll touch real briefly on how we did this. So let's just scroll up here to the Oscar Blues ad. So here's our ad. Basically, what we've done is we've made a slideshow here, right? And in order to see how this slideshow works, I need to turn on my guides. You can see the yellow boxes. They're a little hard to read because of the background. But so those yellow boxes are buttons that influence this slideshow. So this box will say, go to slide content. You know what? That layer is locked. that off. Now it's not. It says content ID, which is the slideshow, change to content index number two, so slide two. Let's take a look at what that slide deck looks like, or that slideshow. Oscar Blues, that one was named well, so we can jump back and forth. So this is the home slide or the first slide of the slideshow and this is what it changes to 
when someone taps on that button. Essentially, they're all placed in the same space, or same place. Uh, I made this a little large to make it feel like you're zooming in on it, and then blacked out the rest of the cans so that way we could place some text over top of it and offer Oscar Blues a way to kind of advertise or sell Dale's Pale Ale. And same with the Gooba and the Old Chub, Yellow Pills. I actually really like the Yellow Pills. It's pretty good beer. So yeah, that is pretty much how it's done. And um, notice in each one of these, I've placed the close button in the top left corner of the slideshow so that when the user taps right here in this box up here, they can close out of it and return back to the state. All right, so that's what Jabber Issue Volume 1 looks like, and you've also seen what Jabber Volume Issue 2 looks like. I'm sure we'll be providing these files to everybody, and we'll communicate out how to access them uh, after the C seminar is over. Now back to my PowerPoints to touch on some of our best practices. So affordance is by far the most important element that needs to be present in your issue. Affordance is not a word most people use in their daily conversation, so I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. Affordance is a way of representing to the user that there is an action required or available to them without necessarily spelling it out. It instructs the user how to use whatever they're interacting with. Good affordance instructs the user so so well that it's a natural and it's instinctive to them. It exists everywhere. We just don't notice it usually. Like the push on a push door, right? If you see the the shape that you usually pull from but it's a push, it can be confusing. And that's just a, a commonplace or a tea kettle. You know, when you pick something up that you've never used before, but you instinctively know how to use it, that's good affordance, and it's found everywhere. So, for instance, in Jabber, let's say you have content on a page below the current page that you're on. We've talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, this, again, is a representation of that. You want to show the user that they need to scroll down or swipe up to go down to continue on to read the article. But you don't want to say, now these are air quotes, you can't see them, but swipe in an upwards direction to continue reading the article, end quotes. No, you want to show the user with a certain representation. And here I've done so in four different ways. It's maybe a little bit overkill, but one of them is part of the design, so that one doesn't really count, kind of. So here we have the four dots on the far left that let the user know that there are four pages in this article. And then since they're on top of each other, they're likely also going to think that they are stacked on top of each other, which they are, hence the name stacked. I've also used the word start with a dashed line leading off the page to indicate that there's more to come and that exists below the page. I mentioned earlier that when I'm speaking about master's, when I was speaking about master's page, that I ha if I ever have content below the, con the current page, I would use master B. Well, here is the icon that I mentioned that represents that there is content below, and I use that consistently. And consistency is also a very important thing to use when you trying to establish affordance to or representation of an icon. Uh, and then lastly, on the far right, there's this little arrow and a circle. That is standard when you're using stacks, and Quark Express will actually place that upon output into your issue. Now, another thing to keep in mind uh, that I, um, I fell into the trap when I first started designing issues um, 
is that I think as designers we have a habitual um, we are habitual. We are a habitual group of individuals, or at least to a certain point. Um, I'm guilty of this just as much as the next person. So when I first set out to create issues, back when Quark was just starting to develop this technology, I made the mistake of using print standards and guidelines for laying out all the copy. It made sense to me because we were working in a traditional print layout software and aren't issues basically just print the documents thrown up into the iPad in a digital form, meaning RGB, 72 DPI, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's what I thought, thought when I first started, and I was actually very, very wrong. Um, they vary greatly from traditional print media. The issues do. I mean, you still use the same tools and lay them out in the same way, but the best practices are different. So here at Quark, we typically set up our body copy in all, in all of our printed collateral to be 8 over 12. So out of habit, I did just that. And for my first attempt at creating an issue, I quickly realized that this is not going to work. So when I exported it, I looked at it on my iPad, and I was literally le reading legal copy. It was that small. I nearly had to break out, of my, magnifi break out my magnifying glass, actually. So uh, after a long time of trial and error, I finally came to the conclusion that the optimum size for a copy in the iPad is about 200% what you would normally do for traditional print media. Um, so by that I mean what was 8 point for us in print now became 16 point and seemed to be the size that I was initially intending it to be once viewed on the iPad. And I had to also adjust the, current, or the lighting as well and lighting went to be 24. Now, as I said earlier, it's important to keep your audience in mind, not only who they are, but also when they'll be interacting with your issue, slash app. Um, I started to think about this as I was creating Jabber uh, and thought, when are people going to hopefully be reading this? In the morning when they're sitting down to eat breakfast, maybe drinking their coffee, maybe on the subway or bus um, on the way into work, hopefully not as they're driving into work, um, maybe if they're carpooling, uh, possibly sitting at their desk over lunch, reading uh, something that interests them in Jabber under those lovely fluorescent lights, or at home after work, uh, as they're sitting down having a cocktail, or possibly at night as they're getting ready to go to bed uh, and their spouse or significant other or whomever uh, asks them to turn out the light, but they're not done with the article. They really, really, really enjoy this article, uh, and they don't want to put it down, so, so it's dark. The reason why this is important is because unlike traditional publishing where readers rely on reflected light to read, digital publishing uses an iPad which uses projected light. And where this becomes the biggest problem is when the lighting is very low. I don't know about you, but myself personally, I have a habit of checking my phone before I go to bed. I have an iPhone and uh, it can be extremely bright, blindingly so. And so I thought that this would be a problem. I have a hard time getting through an email with it being so bright. I can't imagine someone sitting down and trying to read through an article when it's so bright. And instead of having the user exit the, art, exit the issue, exit the app, open up system preferences, find the brightness controls, turn down the brightness, exit back out of system preferences, find your app, open that back up, get back into the issue, and find its place again, where they're reading, I thought there has to be a better way to do this. And so this is why I've done the night versus day, uh, two different orientations with the reverse. Um, in this case here on the slide, I'm showing you that it doesn't necessarily have to be the same copy. You can utilize this to, to demonstrate to the user that you're, they're, they're viewing different copy, but you can also use it to facilitate them when reading articles, um, possibly at night.
Now, another aspect of digital publishing that we should keep in mind is to be aware that you are creating issues that are digital issues, not PDFs. We've been able to open PDFs, PDFs on our mobile devices for a long time now. What makes this different is the interactive portion of each of your issues you produce. Simply placing some text, like what, what's in a white paper, giving it very little graphical treatment, dropping an occasional video, and then pushing it to the iPad doesn't necessarily make it a digital publication. This may, may sound slightly harsh, but I consider them glorified PDFs. Digital publications are meant to be interacted with, experienced. It is supposed to enhance the user experience, not necessarily cheapen it. And if there's a hyperlink, it's a link. Remember that not everyone will have internet connectivity at all times, but it's a link and you should link it out to the web. Just a good best practice. And lastly, but definitely not least, something that's very important to keep in mind, since this is a digital file, and essentially, and in almost every case, the user will be downloading this from their iPod, either over wireless connection or 3, 4G. Keep the file size down. Currently, Jabber is approximately 120 megabytes. Not too bad. It's a little large, but some of the other issues of magazines that, that are out there that I've downloaded are over or as large as 500 megabytes. It can take a very, very, very long time to download the entire issue, which you could argue um, would upset the user and give them a bad user experience before they've even had time to interact with your issue. I'd give up. So everyone has their own personal preference, but I would suggest that 500 megabytes is way too large and I'd try to keep it at about 250 megabytes. It all depends on how many videos you put in. Um, that's going to be your driving force. Everything else doesn't necessarily make it as large. So a few tips here before uh, we're done with our little e-seminar. To expedite the layout process of creating your issues, share your content. Not only create your interactive layouts, like your scroll boxes and everything, to be the same um, size and so that way you could share them across the two different orientations, but also your content. Here uh, within Quark Express, we have the shared content palette. You can add your text to that and then sync essentially that content across both orientations so that way when you make changes let's say you have a typo in one it automatically updates in the other orientation and the trick if you're going to do the white on black and the black on white uh, kind of technique you will want to make sure that you don't share the attributes just the content and you'll have a little dialog box that will pop up when you have the uh, when you go to share your content Next, or last, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, but you want to save the table of contents and linking to the very end of creating your issue. Because as you're going through this, you're going to find that you know someone's going to add an ad last minute, and it's going to screw up your order as far as pages and everything goes within your issue. Then you're going to have to go back and relink every one of those links that bounces you from like the table of contents link or um, if you have someone jumping to a different page that has corresponding uh, content, all that stuff's going to have to go back and be changed to bring it up to date after you've added that page to correct it. Otherwise, you're going to have people jumping to different pages that you didn't necessarily want. So I would highly recommend saving making your table of contents and linking within your document to the very, very end of creating your issue. All right, so that was pretty much Jabber in a brief 45-minute nutshell. Um, kind of showed you a few of the files and everything, uh, how some of the more advanced interactivity uh, is created, and um, kind of talked a few about a few best practices and tips and tricks that I've discovered having created a few of these issues. Um, if 
you want and haven't gone out and checked out Jabber yet, it's up on the iTunes store. It's right there at that link. Um, or if you just go and search for Quark or Jabber or both, um, it's probably going to show up. And um, download it, check it out. Uh, I think we've done a really great job of demonstrating Quark Express's capabilities within App Studio and the interactive um, digital publishing. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm going to ha have my uh, email address up here in the next slide. Feel free to shoot me an email at any time. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And with that, thank you very, very much.